So everyone, good morning. We are mostly going to talk about augmented reality today, and that's because I've been working on some ideas that are about to come out in a book called Augmented Reality. And again, because she gets a big shout out in the acknowledgments, Fiona was instrumental in telling me that this was a great publisher and I had to write this book. So once again, thank you, Fiona, for connecting me two years ago with Polity Press so that this book can come out because this book really sums up, it's not a book about technology particularly, it's a book about the implications of a technology that's about to be deployed at scale. Now augmented reality we think of as something that's ahead of us in the timeline, something that's going to happen. Actually, augmented reality is already substantially behind us in the timeline. It has already happened. And I want to show you what happened in the very first days that augmented reality was deployed at scale. That is the suburb of Rhodes in Sydney, sort of about 10 k's out of the Sydney center. It's on the train line, you can take a train to Rhodes. Many of you have probably been through Rhodes on the train. It's a pretty common place to go as a suburb. And on the evening of Wednesday, the 13th of July, 2016, at a little public park called Peg Patterson Park, effectively what happened was a riot happened. And I open my book with this story because this story tells us a lot about what the shape of an augmented reality future looks like. Because these folks here who are gathering, who are blocking traffic, who are coming in taxis, who are getting out, who are congregating at 11 p.m. on a weeknight, making so much noise that all of the tower blocks that are near them can't sleep that evening. So the police are very soon to be called in and to clear everyone, to disperse everyone. But the reason they've all gathered there is because they're all playing Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go was released in Australia a few days before it was released everywhere else in the world. And what happened was Peg Patterson Park, for reasons that will become clear over this lecture, became a focal point for people playing Pokemon Go. It turns out there were poke gyms and poke stops there. And the first few people who found this out then sent messages out on Facebook and on Twitter and on whatever private messaging channels they were using. And they told their friends to come along because there was some Pokemon here to be caught. And then they told a few friends and then they told a few friends. And all of a sudden, you now have hundreds of people in the middle of the park, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the week, making such a commotion. This happened because Niantic, the creator of Pokemon Go, found a way to inscribe meaning into the space at the park. Augmented reality is a way of adding meaning, adding metadata to the world around us. And it turns out, and this is one of the major statements in my book, that when you change the meaning of space, when you write something into space, you change the behavior of people in that space because people will read what are written in that space and then they will change and act accordingly. And that's what happened to all of these people. They were all reacting to what Niantic, the creator of Pokemon Go, had written in this space. All right, let's go back to see actually how did this come to be? Well, we have to go back all the way to the 1990s. That's John Hank. John Hank had founded several game companies, sold them all successfully. In 2001, he founded a company called Keyhole. Now, you won't have heard of Keyhole, but Keyhole came to prominence during the Iraq War in 2003 because Keyhole had been founded to provide high-resolution imagery of the entire Earth's surface. Something that sounds pretty normal today, but had never really been done before. And so when the trend the troops and the tanks were invading Iraq in 2003, and CNN needed to have a good look at whatever area a tank battle was happening or where troops were stationed or what a particular facility looked like. They tapped Keyhole, and Keyhole's imagery was used live on CNN during all of the Gulf War. That was a really good moment for Hanky because it turns out that there was a company that was looking to have that kind of impressive capability in their own arsenal. That company was a firm that was still relatively small but very influential known as Google. And Google bought Keyhole in 2004. Why did they buy Keyhole? 
Well, Google in 2004 understood lexical search, that's searching by keywords completely. What they didn't understand and didn't know how to do was locative search. How can you find the things, not that you know to look for by name, but how do you discover the things that are around you? And Keyhole became one of the central points of this idea of locative search. And so Hanke started to build a locative search capacity inside of Google, which eventually, of course, evolved into both Google Earth, which you probably used, and something that you've obviously all used on your smartphone, Google Maps. Now, Google Maps represents an enormous collection of data about the world. So Google has been constantly sucking down all of the locative data that it can about the world around so that it can present a view of that. But one of the things to note about Google Maps and Google Maps view of the world is it's not showing you the world as it is. It is showing you a view of the world that suits Google's way you want to use the world. Google shows you the objects of interest that it wants to direct you to, the businesses that it wants to direct you to, the communications channels and the public transport channels that it wants you be, to be directed to. And in fact, if you use driving directions with Google, you're taking the route that Google wants you to. So what you have to understand is that although Google Maps attempts or at least portrays itself as trying to show the world, what it's showing you is something that's filtered and shaped in order to direct the behavior of the people who are using that. So, in the early 2000s, we see the first versions of Google Maps, which were developed here in Sydney by John Hankey and his team. And then we get a little bit on, and John Hankey starts to realize that when you inscribe data into the world, you can change people's behavior in it. And not only that, but that doesn't have to necessarily be real world data. That can actually be locative data that is narrative based, that is telling a story. And the inflection moment for that happens in 2007. When the iPhone is released, Steve Jobs shows off the key apps that are on the iPhone. And one of the apps that he made sure he showed everyone was the new Google Maps app because the iPhone had a high quality processor, a high quality display, and it had GPS so that the phone knew where it was. That was a relatively new thing for phones at that time. And it also had mobile broadband so it could be consistently talking to Google service to bring up the Google map to show exactly where you were at that moment. That combination was completely revolutionary because it put locative data into everyone's hands. It's so revolutionary that it's become bog standard. We don't even think about this capacity anymore. We just assume that any smartphone we use is going to be able to locate us in space and to feed us information about the native nature of that space. Now, John Hankey thought, well, okay, that's good, but what if we start to take space and write a story into that space? And that story became a game that he was developing called Ingress. And here's a trailer for that game. What was the net effect of the Niantic project? We had crossed a threshold in which global security could be at risk. Encrypting the data was the mistake. This is not psychosis or some cognitive break, but an actual takeover of the mind. Much of the public sculpture found in our cities is based on design seeded in the human mind. Certain places have an energy that not only attracts people, but attracts events. The mission of 13 Magnus is to monitor the effects of mind hacking. Obviously, this will be done with the highest of security to make sure that the ideas do not contaminate or threaten humanity. This all leads to Niantic. I know that many tools will be needed to fight this battle. You just have to know where to look and know what you're seeing. Portals emit exotic matter into our world, and that matter has certain effects on our world. I started noticing that there were energy fields, anomalies on Earth all around me. A few of them exhibit properties that are as yet Unexplained. I know that there are others out there. What if they're already among us, but we don't realize it? And I must be prepared to work with them or fight them. They are coming. Something's wrong out there in the world. This doesn't feel like a scientific study. The one hope lies in understanding what happened at Niantic. Not all mysteries are solvable, but the joy comes in the pursuit.
Ingress was the first game that connected space in a very real sense into the video gaming world. What it did was it placed data into space. It placed that data locatively, and it did it in such a way that it allowed players to explore the space, try to find those monuments. It was basically a capture the flag game where the two global teams were consistently working to capture monuments, to capture these portals between the world that had this special energy that Ingrid was talking about. And so it really got to a global scale within a year there were a million players across different platforms, and it was looking at monuments that were located all over the world. It turns out that when Niantic created this game, one of the monuments that they located was in Peg Patterson Park in Sydney. And so Ingress players would go to Peg Patterson Park to play Ingress. Now, when you're playing an augmented reality game, it is using the full capacity of all of the sensors on your smartphones. It's using GPS so that it knows where you are. It's using your compass and your orientation sensors so that it knows where you're looking. But it's also using the cameras so that it can actually get a sense of the scenery around you. So what's happening is this data is being gathered in real time by your smartphone. It's being used by the game. And some of that data after processing is also being sent back to Niantic. I want you to think of this a bit like a trail that's laid down by an ant. The first player who goes to Peg Patterson Park sends a little bit of data back to Niantic, and that sets up a feedback loop that causes more players to start to enter Peg Patterson Park because Niantic knows more about it, can situate things more clearly there, and so that park becomes a central feature in Ingress. And that was the way that this happened. So these augmented reality games, by playing them, generate more data because the players themselves effectively turn themselves into the equivalent of Google's Maps cars, the kinds of uh, the street view cars that we see driving around Sydney's that are basically ga just gathering all of the data they can, whether it's physical sensors or Wi-Fi sensors or camera sensors, it doesn't matter, but these cars are just slurping up all of the data which goes into Google's databases. And the same thing is happening with Niantic and with all the players of Ingress. They're turning the players into data sensors, which is building up this data. Now, around 2012, 2013, Google decides that Niantic's project with Ingress is interesting, but they don't really want to be doing that as a business. They have other fish to fry. And so they begin the process of spinning Niantic out of Google. So Google basically takes the Niantic project, says, okay, you're a separate company now. And this is exactly the point where we start to understand that no matter how you slice it, Augmented reality, in order to work correctly, has to be a technology of surveillance. That in fact, unless you can get a good look of the space around you, you can't play an augmented reality game in that space because you don't know how to situate things. You don't know how to find the monument. So everyone who is playing an augmented reality game or using an augmented reality app is essentially using the surveillance capabilities of the devices that are generating that in order to be able to produce the augmented reality effect. Now, this is one of the major points that I make in this book, and if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, remember that point, that augmented reality is, by definition, a technology of surveillance because surveillance is how augmented reality works. All right, so we now come to a point where after the success of Ingress, which was only modestly successful, essentially what happened was Nintendo, who owned Pokemon, came to Niantic and said, all right, we now have this capacity to be able to do Pokemon, to take the imaginary world of Pokemon, who existed basically only in anime and in figurines and in a card game. Now what we can do is we can inscribe the real world with all of the qualities of Pokemon so that we can now turn the world of Pokemon into a shared experience in the real world. And this is Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is one of the most successful mobile games of all time. Had hundreds of millions of players across 2016, 2017, still has a lot of people playing it. And what it did was it basically turned every smartphone player 
into a data gathering center for both Niantic so that it was building up consistently its map of the world and also for Pokemon so that they were both using the surveillance capabilities to understand where the players were playing to improve the play of the game and to build their maps of the world. And this is going to become a consistently repeating theme over the history of AR. Any company that wants to build up resources in augmented reality has to build up these maps of the world because these maps of the world are the way augmented reality works. Now this year Microsoft released Minecraft Earth. It's a version of Minecraft that is augmented reality. Again, works by exactly the same idea that it uses the smartphone camera to situate the players everywhere in the world so they can build their things. But Microsoft is now also using the data that's being gathered by that game to increasingly improve the accuracy of their own map of the world. All right. All of these systems are smartphone based. They're all fun. They're all interesting. They're not where we're going to be going over the next couple of years. Where we're going to be going over the next couple of years is into what we would call spectacles or mirror shades. So these are devices that look a lot like a pair of glasses, maybe sunglasses, that have embedded in them a full augmented reality system so that wherever you look, the augmented reality is around you. So that rather than having a screen that's in front of you so that the augmented reality world is just a tiny bit of the field of view, what happens is you move the screen over your eyes and now your entire field of view, wherever you look, is now augmented reality. And there are two companies that are absolutely in the forefront of them. Apple, which has been working on this for years and years and years, and Facebook. Facebook just last month had its Facebook Connect meeting where they talk about to their developers all of the things they're working on in augmented and virtual reality. And during that, they revealed the prototype, not of augmented reality glasses, but of the kinds of sensors that people were going to need in order to be able to map the spaces they were in so that augmented reality will work. And here's a, about a four minute introduction for what they call Project Aria. These are Facebook's augmented reality data gathering tools. Think of them as the equivalent of the Google Street View car, but for your face. Project Aria is a research effort built around the custom glasses you see here that is designed to record high quality egocentric data, which in turn will enable researchers to advance the state of the art around machine perception and personalized contextually aware AI. Project Aria is not in itself an AR device since it lacks a display, and it is neither a product nor a prototype of a product and will not be for sale. It is a research tool and it is a critical step on the path to live maps and the interface of the future. One way to think about Project Aria is as an evolution of the methods which were used to build maps in the past. Since the 1960s, satellites have allowed us to map outdoor environments at tremendous scale, but they're limited in the map resolution and freshness they can produce. Low-flying aircraft and car fleets provided data capture at a higher resolution with increased update rates, but they're limited to outdoor environments. Backpack rigs can now map indoor spaces at high resolution but are unable to fully capture the wide range of environments relevant to our daily lives. Project Aria is the vanguard of the next leap in data capture technology, client-based mapping, which will one day enable anyone with an AR device to build and use live maps wherever and whenever they need to based on data from their own devices, particularly AR glasses. The use of egocentric data will make it possible to construct higher resolution maps that are dynamically updated at a much higher frequency and will enable mapping of a far greater spectrum of environments than has been possible with any previous mapping technology. In addition to enabling state-of-the-art research into map building, Project ARIA will let researchers explore what data AR glasses will need to capture in actual use and how AI can most usefully leverage that data to provide personalized assistance. Let's take a look at each component of Project ARIA in closer detail. At its heart, Project Aria is an all-day wearable computer and sensor platform with a powerful mobile class processor, all wrapped up in an ergonomic glasses form factor weighing under 70 grams. The device is controlled by the wearer using a mobile companion app, which communicates via an encrypted low-energy Bluetooth link. As Boz noted, once a data sequence has been recorded and the device is placed on charge, data is uploaded to Facebook's research servers and kept in quarantine meaning it's not made available to researchers. During the quarantine period, participants can delete segments of captured data from the system without accessing the raw data. 
Any data that is gathered in public places is also passed through a set of privacy filters by our system to automatically blur faces and license plates. A prominent LED indicates when the device is recording, and ending a recording is as simple as flicking the mute switch on the side of the glasses. Project ARIA supports a variety of sensors that gather the sort of data that AR glasses will need to capture. These include a front-facing RGB camera, two side-facing monochrome cameras, and dual IMUs, which each contain an accelerometer and a gyroscope. This combination of sensors allows us to both observe the environment and track the position of the glasses, the wearer's hands, and objects within the scene. In this example, we can see the trajectory of the device being calculated from both the camera and the IMUs as the glasses wearer interacts in an apartment setting. In addition to sensors to visually observe the world, Project ARIA supports seven directional microphones for spatialized audio capture and two inward-facing cameras to monitor One the direction of the wearer's gaze. The eye tracking. That's a very, By combining very data from the inward-facing we'll sensors with live maps, movement. our researchers have shown we can project the gaze of the wearer into the map of their environment, creating a powerful tool for understanding user intent. The combination of these powerful sensing, location, and indexing technologies with an always-on wearable form factor raises important questions about the privacy controls that will need to be in place to prevent misuse. Project ARIA has been developed precisely to enable us to address those challenges long before AR glasses are commercially available and, as Boz described, already has privacy controls in place. Starting this month, Facebook employees will be using Project ARIA devices in public and private spaces, including their homes, and also on our campuses once they reopen, in order to help inform the development of live maps and contextualized AI. That's just a quick look at the capabilities that Project ARIA brings to AR and AI research, but I hope you now have a sense of why it's an essential part of building the machine perception foundation for the AR future. There is so much here to unpack. I, I almost don't know where to start, and in some ways I wanted to deliver this talk just by showing that video and then sort of unpacking all of it, but I realized you actually needed some context to understand why Facebook would make a device like this, and it's because Facebook is really trying to do everything in its power to map the world and to get its users to map the world so that it can create as effective augmented reality as possible. Now, they're calling this egocentric scanning. I call it ego scanning, so that means that you're going from the self, the ego, the eye, and you're looking out into the world. Now, one of the things that they state over and over, or well, two of the things, one of the things they state is the number of sensors they have looking out into the world, and the second is the number of privacy protections they're putting in. So let's have unpack both of these separately. So, first, the number of sensors. Again, you're going to need a very full complement of cameras and microphones, orientation sensors, all of the things. You saw how just the headset itself could track someone's movements around the apartment. Because the cameras are watching where the walls are going as you're turning your head, all of this is now very well coded into computer algorithms. If you have that data stream, you can actually map the position of someone's head in real time as they're moving through a space, which you need to do in order to be able to have augmented reality in that space with that person. You also have all of the microphone sensors so that you can hear the things that are going around in case there are commands or just noise in the environment or things that they want to be aware of that can be happening fully spatialized so that they sound like they're happening all around the person. And then you have, very interestingly, the set of sensors that are pointed inward, that are pointed at the self. And the most interesting of those are the eye sensors because gaze detection is in fact the thing that Facebook is most interested in here because gaze detection reveals what you're actually interested in, not what you say you're interested in, not what you believe you're interested in, but what you instinctively at a gut level in your body know that you're interested in. Why does your eye flick across that thing? Well, Facebook will be collecting that data in real time, not just on Project Aria, but as a basic part of whatever headset that it makes, because that is going to be a basic part of its operation. So that surveillance in augmented reality, it doesn't just point outward into the world, it points inward onto ourselves. 
So we are being revealed as the world is being revealed. Now, Facebook has a problem with privacy. Let me give you two examples here. So three and a half years ago, the Australian reported that Facebook Australia had been caught telling its biggest advertisers, its 20 biggest advertisers, that they knew exactly when teenage users were feeling insecure or depressed or uncertain, and that they were peddling that information available to Facebook in real time from a semantic analysis of the posts of those teenagers so that advertisers could target ads to those teenagers at their most vulnerable. All right, this is a huge scandal. Facebook basically never denied it. The people who were responsible were the co-CEOs of Facebook's Australian organization. So this was not a rogue project. A couple of years before that, Facebook had also been caught changing the content of the news feed of 670,000 of its users, either making that feed more positive or more negative, and then watching to see whether they could create what they called social contagion. In other words, infecting someone's feelings by showing them a particular kind of content. Of course, it turns out if you show people more positive stuff, they're probably going to feel more positive. If you feed them more negative stuff, they're probably going to feel more negative. And Facebook never admitted this until there were papers published in journals which quoted the work that had been done. They certainly never informed the users that they were being tested on while the tests were taking place. So Facebook has consistently had problems with privacy, and now they are building devices that will be collecting an unprecedented amount of data data about the world. Now, Facebook says, oh, well, we're learning how to make sure that all of that data is handled safely. Well, all of that data, in order to be handled safely, still has to be uploaded to Facebook servers, wherever they might be in the world, for processing, for a determination of what's private and what's not, for what's important and what's not. That's not going to be happening on the device. That's not going to be happening on the cell phone. That will be happening over the network. So, not only are all augmented reality devices surveillance systems, all augmented reality devices are networked surveillance systems. And to be the center point in that network is to be the possessor of an enormous amount of power. And so now we come to the fundamental dilemmas surrounding augmented reality. It is an amazing technology. It is a profound technology. It's a technology that can produce amazing changes in human behavior. Come all the way back to the example of Peg Patterson Park. Just by inscribing a little Pokemon data in space, they managed to produce what was effectively a riot. That kind of common, that kind of inscribing of space is about to become common across the entire world. It will give us depth that we don't know. We will be able to look into something and understand it in new ways. It will glue the digital world and the real world together in ways that we hadn't been able to conceive of before. But there's a price here. The essential dilemma for being able to do that is to place all of us, billions of people, because these devices will effectively start to replace the smartphone by the end of this decade. Billions of these devices worn by billions of people will be collecting an unprecedented level of personal, private data everyone who's using them. And so we have to think very carefully about the decisions we make with these devices, and we have to ask very hard questions about who is collecting that data and how that data is being put to work. Thank you.